Oops. And to wrap up here, there isn't too much left. Oops, wrong slide. Thank you. Okay. So to wrap up this idea here, remember we're predicting uh, average coffee sales with our lines, but that prediction may be off from what the actual data point is at a given value. And uh, you also might be asking yourself, well, there are multiple days at say 40, like two degrees or multiple days at 50 degrees. So what does that mean? Well, that means is that every single data point has a residual. While there is only one prediction at 40 degrees, we just get the prediction from the line, every single one of these data points has an associated residual with it. So our line, and basically that's why we think of our line as an average prediction. Our line is basically averaging all these points as it goes down. It's averaging the position of all these points. It's averaging the position vertically with all these points. It's averaging the position vertically with all these points. So you can have as many data points as you want at a given temperature. You're still going to get one predicted value, and each of those data points is going to have an associated residual for how close the line got to that predicted, uh, how close the line got to that actual coffee sale number. So how do we actually calculate what the residual is for a given data point at a given temperature? So let's say that our predicted line gives us on a 40 degree day, we plug in 40 degrees for the explanatory variable of temperature and we get predicted average coffee sales of 27,189. What if the, there was an actual data point of 40 degrees and 27,100 coffee sold? The actual value is 27,100 coffee sold on that day. Maybe one right, uh, one right in here. How do we calculate the residual at that data point for the line and the actual value? Well, we take the observed value, 27,100, and we subtract the predicted value, y minus y hat, observed minus predicted. And then we subtract those things at negative 89. So our residual for this data point is negative 89 coffee sold. In a sense, the linear model over predicted was too high by 89 units, the number of coffee sold. y minus y hat, observed minus predicted, the residual is in minus 89. Okay, last big topic with this is the quality of the data and the quality of what we want our regression to look like. And I'm going to just do this out of order for a second here um, because I think this will be more effective. Um, so quality that we need for our data for linear regression falls under a bunch of assumptions. Just like when using the t-test, we needed certain assumptions to do it. We needed before for our t-test, we needed the sample size to be greater than 30 or the data to look normally distributed. For linear regression, we have a bunch of assumptions and these need to be fulfilled or else basically we run into problems. We need to make adjustments or linear regression may not be the best technique for us. So here's, I just had them up there, but let's go one by one what we need. Um, and we won't fully get into all these, but just so you know that they're here. Uh, the data values, at least our dependent variable data values are observations. So for example, our coffee sales, they need to be independent from each other. That is, the sales of coffee on one day should not influence the sales of coffee on another day. We run into statistical problems. So the observations need to be independent from one another. Um, random sampling, okay, big, uh, okay, we're not really gonna, going to get into this, but at least want to take this opportunity to say this. There's a big misconception in a lot of textbooks. And yes, I'm big at tearing down textbooks where they're wrong. There's a 
a lot of misconceptions in textbooks that say if you take a random sample, it guarantees that your data are independent of each other. And that's not always true. It, it just isn't by the, the mechanics of how certain things are. Um, you could take a random sample of uh, people and get a bunch of them who are twins with one another and do health outcomes. Well, the health outcomes on any pair of twins are going to be pretty related to one another because they're twins. So those wouldn't be very independent. Anyway, point being, we just need our observations to be independent from one another and not influence each other. That's within a particular variable, the response variable generally. So for example, our coffee sales. You're not going to really deal with that too much. I just wanted to uh, give it some uh, conceptual spotlight before we move on. Okay. The other thing we need, we would like our residuals, these things we were just talking about, our errors, our residuals, we would like these to be normally distributed. And this is similar to wanting the response variable, in our case, the coffee sales, wanting those to be normally distributed. Um, the assumptions for linear regression, we could make them generally about the response variable, the in this case, the coffee sales, uh, but we tend to state them in terms of the errors or the residuals, because that's what goes into our inferences and our inferential calculations and our p-values. So um, again, more stuff that you need to know, but I'm just giving you some background for where these things come from. The thing to focus on is we will see, we want all of our residuals for all of our data points Remember, every data point has a residual. Every data point has a prediction that the line gives to it. And therefore, every data point has a residual. Every data point has some amount of error that the line has, has, has bestowed upon it, the difference between the actual data point and the residual. So we can gather all those and look at their distribution. We would like those to be normally distributed. We would also like those residuals to have, in a sense, a constant variability as you order and look across them in a certain order. And I'll show you what that means in a second. But they need to have constant variance. In other words, we do not want to see any particular kind of pattern in the residuals when we graph them. And, and I'll show you that in a second. So normally distributed residuals, residuals that on the whole show a constant variance. And lastly, oh, two more. All right. And we also want the relationship naturally to be linear. We need to have a linear relationship in the first place in order to use linear regression. There are fancy things we can do if we don't have that, but for now, all you need to worry about is say, hey, I look at my data, my scatter plot, and hopefully it looks pretty linear. You can also see the same thing with your residuals, but I think it's a little bit harder at this point. Just plot your data. Plot your data. If it looks linear, great. We've met that assumption for this linear model. And this is sort of redundant with variability and norm normality that no big outliers. So again, you can see this from your data. You can also see it from residuals, but for now you can just plot your data and see if there are big residuals. The reason this is redundant is that if there are big residuals in your data, it will mess up the normal distribution of your residuals. It will mess up the constant variability in your residuals just because it's an outlier and it's way out there and it's going to yank on your data set. It's going to yank on your results. It's going to mess up everything. So in review, we want the observations of our response variable, in this case, the observations of our coffee sales to be independent of one another. We don't want the coffee sales on one day influencing the coffee sales on another day completely on their own that introduces statistical problems. Uh, and we want our errors, our residuals, or if you want to think of it, just our response variable data to be normally distributed, to be nicely constant in its variability when ordered, which you will see, and we want there to be a linear relationship apparently in the first place in order to use simple linear regression. And going along with all that is no big outliers. They're related. Okay, so what does this normal distribution and this variability of residuals uh, look like? What are we talking about here? So again, if we take, come on, if we take every single data point and find its residual, we can gather it. It's a value. So for example, this residual was negative 89. We can look at this plot and say, well, this residual 
might be uh, about 10,000. This residual might be about 3,000. Uh, this residual might be about negative 4,000 or negative 2,000, something like that. We can gather up all these residuals and we can do things with them. So if we gather up all these residuals, we can plot them. And th this is not this is not the coffee temperature day anymore. These are just examples. First of all, if we plot a histogram of them, we want the histogram to look roughly normal. This is the normality assumption that we just talked about. So we want our residuals to look roughly normal. If not, then basically our inferences and the things we're saying with our line aren't particularly reliable. So we want them to be normally distributed. When we order the residuals, so this is just a convention. It's a, it may be a little hard to grasp, and I apologize for that. But I'm just going to show you the convention and just sort of say it straight up. When we analyze residuals in a scatter plot, we tend to put the residuals on the y-axis and some way to order them on the x-axis. In this case, we could put uh, the actual explanatory variable, like temperature in this case. Or a common way to do it is to put on the predicted temperatures or the predicted values. So the common way we plot uh, the residuals to assess uh, certain things about the residuals is to say, okay, give me the predicted values from my regression equation on the x-axis and give me the residual that's associated with it on the y-axis. When we do that, we get some pattern that looks like this. What we want, what we want our residuals to look like is random. The reason is that the residual is the error. We want our error to look random. If our error looks like it has pattern, that means we're probably not doing a very good job with our model. If our error has pattern to it, that means that our error is probably describing something or capturing a variable or doing something that we didn't do in our model. So we want these residuals to look random. And an easy way to do that is to just put on the horizontal line uh, of zero, uh, the horizontal line of zero. So again, we want these to look random around this line. The constant variance assumption comes in when we look left to right and are assessing the, the variability of our residuals in the vertical direction. So like from zero to 20 of whatever this fitted value is, there's a small amount of variance in these residuals. Now go from 20 to 25. Looking vertically, there's a larger variance of residuals compared to going from zero to 20. Again, small amount of variance, larger amount of variance. As we go over, eh, the variance stays about the same vertically. So in here, it's a certain amount. In here, it's a certain amount. We want this to look random. We want that variance to be constant. We need that to be this way so that we have reliable predictions from our line and so that we have reliable inferences that we're making about our research situation. Again, this is all very surface level. This is just the mechanical nitty gritty of how this works. And logically, yes, when it's random around the line, it means it's systematically not, not systematically over or under predicting uh, our coffee sales or the thing we're interested in. If our model is systematically over or under predicting something, that means we probably did not make a good model. We probably did not, not pick a good explanatory variable and it's not a good model. So lastly, Again, what do we want our residual plots to look like? Well, we want that constant variance going across. Like this was pretty good. There's a constant vertical variance as we look left to right with uh, uh, looking at these residuals. This is bad. It fans out. Small variance, large variance. There's a pattern here. That's not good. That's not random residual. That's not random error. When there's a pattern, when we've probably violated linearity and constant variance, 
and we need to go back and do some things with our regression. That's it.